Today's Holy Gospel comes to us from Mark 12, the Holy Gospel according to Mark. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples, said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put uh, in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord praise to you, O Christ. Today's gospel passage is part of the Olivet Discourse. It's a collection of Jesus' warnings and foretellings of the end times and what to look out for. It's foretelling of his upcoming passion narrative and how his people will react. It's also foretelling of what some Jewish leadership will do to save their own skins as Rome tries to dismantle Jewish society. And at a higher level, it's also Jesus saying, you know a society has become morally bankrupt, gone south, when you see this, dot, dot, dot. He will lead off with uh, a watch out phrase or take heed or beware. Here are some examples of uh, some beware phrases. Beware of false teachers. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Beware of the allure of greed. Beware or watch out for pride, false prophets, the allure of money, praying so others can admire you. Beware, beware, beware. In today's passage, Jesus warns us against religious hypocrisy. Uh Uh-oh, I have to be careful. This might be for me. Jesus warns against succumbing to the temptations of prestige, power, and materialism with first century scribes as the main example. To understand this passage, we need to know what a scribe is. During the second and first centuries BC, a scribe was a secular official in Jewish society whose whose job it was to interpret legal and financial documents and help reference law in political matters. Think of a lawyer, accountant, and notary rolled into one. Now, as you can imagine, their position held a lot of influence and power in Jewish society, and they were considered a a higher class citizen. During the first century Jesus era, they gained even more power as interpreters and uh, teachers of God's law. Unfortunately, not all scribes exercised their office faithfully and would often interpret the law and Torah to benefit themselves and their class of people. I hope this sounds a little bit familiar to you. Jesus has a distinct problem with hypocrites, people that should know better, but don't act right. Especially people that are immersed in God's word, yet somehow are blind to it. Jesus breaks down his critique in today's passage of scribes in three categories, importance, power, and materialism. Let's go for the first one. The scribes need for importance. They they seem to get off on their prestige. They desired and enjoyed being the center of attention. They seem to long for the limelight and clothe themselves in long robes in order to show everyone how important they were and to to draw attention of others. They wanted to be recognized and hailed in public. Jesus mentions the marketplace because it's a secular designation. What Jesus is saying is they like to be liked. Now, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be respected or well thought of, but these scribes have centered themselves on it. Jesus even says people will hate you because you follow him, in part meaning 
don't make being liked your main thing. Some people are just not going to like you simply because you follow Jesus. We all know that people pleasing is like a dog chasing its tail. It just never ends well. Jesus' second critique, their desire and competition for power in the religious arena. They craved the best seats or literally first couch in the synagogue. It's the best seat in the house where you sat in ancient culture conveyed a lot. That's why the disciples argued over it and Jesus had to set them straight. Where you sit conveys your power and authority, especially in the temple. People will look to the seat of Moses, which literally translates to uh, Moses' couch, which I love. People will look to the seat of Moses when making the final call on a religious argument or ruling. Scribes had this need to be needed, and they wanted that seat of power. They liked being important in church. Similarly, places of honor at feasts were positions of status and power. I'll never forget, I was playing my saxophone at a wedding reception, and right before the doors opened to the reception, someone had snuck in early to see where they were seated. And they were rearranging the name tags on the tables and where they were because they weren't close enough to the bride and groom's table. It was unbelievable. All right, Jesus' third point. Jesus' third point was the scribe's merciless materialism. Merciless materialism, that's hard to say. Here, Jesus points to an example that was widely known in Israel. It was written into the law of Moses that the nation of Israel was to take care of its widows. In fact, there are laws that describe the consequences for cities and temples that didn't take care of their widows. Because you see, unmarried women had a very hard time in first century culture. They could not represent themselves in court. It was a struggle to own and keep property. And people took advantage of it. Okay, people, men took advantage of it. And that's why there were laws in Jewish culture to protect them, to look out for those who couldn't look out for themselves. So what Jesus is saying is anyone that knows the will of God expressed in the law of Moses, like a scribe would, should share God's deep concern for the plight of widows and all of those in need. But here, however, Jesus asserts that these very people who should know the law best are devouring widows' houses. Now, how they did this is not, it's not super clear, but the scribes may have been exploding widows through transactions involving their houses, their personal property, their land. We don't know. But but what is clear is that the scribes were preying greedily upon others for their own personal gain even as they were publicly praying before others to to prove their righteousness before God, as if words would speak louder than actions. But Jesus saw right through that and calls them out. If you really want a litmus test of a healthy community, especially a, a healthy church community, See how it treats those who cannot help themselves. God has deep compassion for those who are left alone. And it's the church's job to demonstrate that same compassion. God knows how hard it is when we are left alone. And part of the purpose and mission of the church is to enfold and surround those who have experienced loss. In a moment in our service, we will take time to remember those we have lost because we want to recognize that it's hard and God's community is here for those who mourn. But the scribes in our story, they missed this. So when Jesus watches a widow put in two small coins, he isn't just complimenting a widow's giving heart. He is giving a seething critique of a lopsided social dynamic. Jesus was mad. Jesus was mad that they weren't taking care of the widows as outlined 
in the Torah, in the law the scribes were supposed to be experts in. This widow shouldn't have had such few coins in a society that was morally obligated to take care of her. I want to say that again. I've, I've heard so many sermons say that Jesus is complimenting this woman's generous heart, as in, wow, she's given so much, all she has, how devoted she is to the work of God. That's not what Jesus is saying. And reading it this way, I think, can cause actual harm to, to people in poverty by suggesting that they give away the little that they need for survival. You got to remember this, this is one of these beware passages. Take heed, watch out. He is talking about the scribes. Jesus is drawing attention to the large sums the scribes are putting in, only a fraction of their total abundance. He's expressing harsh critique that this widow should not only had a few coins in a society that was supposed to be taking care of her. It's amazing how much of this is still relevant in our own society, our own culture. We have people scared to get medical help for fear of medical debt. We have people that have to make choices between putting food on the table and going to school or taking care of loved ones. It's shameful. It's not what God would have us do for our fellow humans. While these three bewares are an essential litmus test for churches and societies, it's also applicable to you and me. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So often, when we read Bible passages, the bad guy, the bad guy is clear. And inside, we can be like, yeah, get him, Jesus. But it's always an interesting exercise to turn it around to ourselves and, and ask, what if? What if we're the bad guy in the analogy? I'm not saying you are but it's a good soul litmus test, heart radar. How do you use importance, power, and the wealth God has given you? I'm sure you've heard these statistics before, but in view of the world, many of us are exceptionally rich. We have resources that can be used to take care of others in incredibly meaningful ways. And you might not think sometimes that, but your voice is important in your circles of influence. And what you decide to speak up for and who you make sure is noticed and how you take care of others matters. I think it certainly matters to the person that you're taking care of. It's also a litmus test for the soul. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about our salvation, but I am talking about the transformative growth of your heart. If your heart feels disconnected, if you're searching for, for meaning and in search of spiritual and heart rebooting, then first look on how you spend your time, how you spend your money, or use your influence. You and I, we are created by design, to help. We are made to take care of people. And if you aren't doing what you are designed to do, then, then yeah, your soul, your heart is going to ache. It won't feel at home. And you will feel like you are missing something because we've not been designed to be insatiable me monsters, getting all we can while we can. We've been made by God to take care of each other and to use what we've been given to be good news for the world. Amen.